let's go back to network advertisements for a bit. We need to lock in some key concepts. We're going to configure OSPF for the topology shown here. There are two routers connected with two links. There is an extra network per router. The first thing is to get OSPF running and form an adjacency. We'll start on R1 using process ID 10. We'll also set a router ID as a matter of best practice. Next, we'll use the network command to enable OSPF on our interfaces. Notice that the wildcard mask covers both interfaces in a single command. We're telling the router to enable OSPF on any network interface with an IP that starts with 172.16.1. Here's the key point. The network command does two things. It enables OSPF on network interfaces identified by the network and wildcard mask, and it advertises any connected networks identified by the network and wildcard mask. So in this case, this means that the router enables OSPF on the two interfaces that connect to R2. They will then start sending hello messages. It also means that 172.16.10/30 and 172.16.14/30 will be advertised. That's because their network's configured on the local router. While we're here, let's add our other network, 192.168.10.0/24 into OSPF. We'll move over to R2 and repeat the process there. That's starting OSPF, setting a router ID, and adding networks. Sorry, I added the wrong network there. To remove that config, we enter the same command with a no in front. Then I'll add the right command. That looks better. The adjacency has come up. We have another network to add, of course. And to confirm, we can look at the OSPF neighbor list. Here we have one neighbor, but two neighbor relationships. We know it's the same router because of the router ID. Let's see these in the routing table. Here's the route learned from R1. Notice that there's two next hops. That's because of the two links, each with the same cost. That's equal cost multipath or ECMP in action. Cisco routers will allow up to four equal cost next hops per path in the routing table by default. If the links have different costs, then only the best one is selected. In a case like this, both the links will share the load. We can compare that to the entries in the LSDB. Notice that there's an entry for each of the two routers. There's also entries for each of the two links. The other networks, 192.168.10 and 192.168.20 are not listed here. The LSDB doesn't include these as they're not paths through to other networks. With that in mind, here's an interesting point. When we use the network command, we do two things. Enable OSPF on an interface, which includes sending and receiving hello messages, and advertise the network on that interface to other routers. What if we want to advertise a network, but we don't want an interface to send hellos? In our example, let's say we want to advertise 192.168.20.0, but we don't want that interface trying to form an adjacency with another router. In this case, we can configure this interface as a passive interface. This prevents OSPF from sending hello messages on that interface, but it still advertises it. Let's see what would happen if we configured gig00 as a passive interface. That's the link with the 172.16.1.0 network. Under the router OSPF config, we use the passive interface command. Straight away, we see that our neighbor relationship over that link drops. That's because it's no longer active, so there can't be an adjacency there. It's easy to confirm this by looking at our list of neighbors. Before we had two adjacencies, but now there's only one. If we go over to the routing table, the route to 192.168.10.0 now only has one next hop. This leads to an obvious question. When would we want to use passive interfaces? Wouldn't it be better to have all possible interfaces working in OSPF? 
I'll leave you to think about that one.